yes yes it is visible i've started the recording as well yeah good okay so hey everyone uh, my name is nitendra bhai so yeah i currently work as atlan as a back end engineer so yeah this is my first talk and today we will be talking about building a search and aggregation service for kubernetes resources yeah so let me go to the next slide yeah so this will be the agenda for today so first we will go through some introduction so we'll give a small introduction to kubernetes and then what are workflows and then we'll go to the problem statement that we will try to solve and then i will give an introduction to a admission controller then we'll go through the kinds of uh, admission controllers and its use cases and then we'll uh, check the architecture of the service which will uh, allow us to search and aggregate kubernetes resources and finally we'll go and build a simple admission controller so let's start with what is kubernetes so basically kubernetes is a container orchestration engine so let's say you have applications right and then you uh, and this uh, applications you are containerizing them and then you want to deploy them now that's where kubernetes comes in so it helps you to deploy your containerized apps manage them scale them by scaling i mean uh, in increasing the number of uh, like number of pods that are running when the certain number of uh, users increases so those kind of good stuff and then uh, yeah so it helps you deploy your uh, applications in an easy way and this is what the like architecture of a kubernetes uh, looks like so it has master node and then worker nodes nodes are basically nothing but uh, computers uh, or servers and then the master node has the api server and scheduler and controller and the other worker nodes have kubelet and the queue proxy so what happens is when you submit a resource to api server it gets stored in a uh, key value store known as etcd now what happens after that is the controller manager uh, based on the res uh, resource that you have created it it sends a request to create the pods and what scheduler does is basically checks on which worker node you, it can schedule the uh, basically pod so basically what happens is let's say you are deploying an application what happens is first your application manifest will be stored on etcd and then controller manager will make sure to create a pod for that and after that the scheduler will take that uh, pod and then create it on the uh, worker node after that uh, after which your application will start running so this is a this is a simple overview of what kubernetes is yeah uh, i will go to the next slide so in this slide we'll talk about workflows so workflows are basically a sequence of tasks so let's say if you want to do some extraction and you want to do some transformation it's a one step after after another right so basically you have to perform the second step after the first step is complete so workflow is basically a sequence of tasks that you want to execute so basically there are many kinds of workflow orchestration engines some of the most popular ones are airflow and argo so airflow is quite popular in the python community so yeah it used a lot and argo is something that is new on the uh, container so on the container orchestration side so basically it's based on kubernetes now let's say uh, the example of this will be let's say you have uh, you have a workflow and then the tasks are like quite heavy in the sense that they might require a good number of resources and they might require scaling up in this case what argo does is argo uses native kubernetes to schedule those tasks and then uh, the, this workflow engine so all of them they represent the uh, workflows as a dag so basically dag is a directed acyclic graph where there is no cycles and uh, in the graph each each node is basically a task and then this is one of the argo workflow examples so here you can see that uh, each task are executed one after another and then it can scale up or scale down based on the requirement and here you can see this so this is uh, as i said um, this is the argo workflow and here each of the tasks that you see are basically a kubernetes pod so here basically argo helps us in the case that let's say you want to give a uh, high resources based on the task that you are performing right so you can manage those thing and it provides quite granular way and that way also you can scale your uh, basically the workflows that you so this is an example of this might this might scale like even higher than this yeah uh, 
So any questions until now? So uh, regarding Kubernetes and workflow. So I just gave a simple introduction, but yeah, any questions until now? Let me check the chat. In workflows, uh, is there any concept of uh, things joining back? Like you you going directly cyclic, right? So you can have multiple folks uh, of tasks running in parallel. So if you mm -hmm. want to then join back after a couple of them are done and continue. Uh, right. How is right. It? Yeah. So there are many ways to do that. So let's say in this example, right? So basically like 10 of these tasks are running parallelly and in the next task, you are basically aggregating the results of all of them, right? So it's actually not going back. The downstream node is basically making sure that it's aggregating all of the results from the uh, previous boss, previous task, yeah. Uh, did I answer your question? Mm, yeah, so we basically my concern was that will it break the cyclicity, acyclicity, but it, it doesn't is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah it present a new task. Right, right. Because your use case, like the uh, the use case, can be performed in a cyclic way. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah. I have a small question, like, like probably for the benefit of audience. Like, I mean, when we write uh, business logic, like we tend to sort of use microservices and then like calling that like we we custom write things. Like by using workflows, is there any additional benefits or like like what use case do you use workflows in contrast to uh, like like a bunch of microservices talking to each other? Right, right. So let's say so example will be something like let's say you want to basically uh, transfer data from let's say a RDMS uh, relation database uh, to a like a document database. Now in that case, you want to do some transformation, you want to pull some data from other sources, right? And then you want to run that uh, on a scheduled basis. So what a workflow can do is basically, it can define a set of tasks where it basically pulls the data from one source, transforms it, does some aggregation and stuff, and then pushes the data to some other destination. So that will be a simple example of, uh, of an workflow. Or and another example can be like, let's say, you submitted some uh, here, like some submitted some file or something uh, on the server, and then you want a workflow to be triggered, which basically splits the file, does some uh, like optimization, or maybe uh, let's say if it's a video, then we can compress the video and those kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thanks. Okay. Cool. Uh, then I will uh, move to the next slide. So as you have seen, so we have discussed about the, the uh, Argo, which is a basically con continuous orchestration engine. Next, we'll go to monitoring the workflow. So each of the examples that are, are Airflow, Argo, they provide a monitoring website, uh, monitoring UI. So basically in the UI, you can see what are the current uh, workflows that are running, what is the status of them, if they have failed in between, and those kind of stuff. Or maybe you can, uh, if they have failed, you want to retry them, you can check the logs of why why they are failed. So those kind of good stuff. But uh, since Argo runs on Kubernetes, you can't basically keep all of your resources persisted on Kubernetes. So let's say you ran 10 workflows on your cluster, right? So they can't be lying there forever since new workflows will have to be run and the uh, your Kubernetes cluster needs to be cleaned up. So that's where TTL comes in. So basically after a certain amount of time, since your resources are stored in Kubernetes etcd, they are removed from there and then they are archived into Postgres so that later you can basically go through go through the runs. Yeah, uh, even uh, Airflow provides a good UI of previous runs, but since uh, Argo uses uh, Kubernetes as its engine, so it can't store the data on uh, etcd itself. It has to move uh, move it to uh, Postgres once once the things are completed. Yeah, this was about the monitoring. So yeah, next we'll go to the problem statement. So we have defined what Kubernetes is. Uh, it helps us run pods on a uh, orchestrate pods or basically containers. And then we have also learned about workflows. Now let's say there's a use case, right? Where basically I want to see 
the runs that are currently running as well as the runs that are archived and i want to do some ag aggregations on them so example maybe let's say there are 100 runs of the workflow on the kubernetes cluster and the next 100 are on the postgres cluster. now i want to do an aggregation on top of them now it will be really difficult because a part of your data is stored on postgres while the other part is uh, present on uh, what is it etcp that is kubernetes you can Check uh check the workflows via Argo sorry via Argo APIs or using the Kubernetes APIs that are present in the for the workflows that are present in Kubernetes cluster. While for the ones that are present in Postgres, you can use the Argo API or you can directly query the Postgres database. But this is a problem, right? So let's say I want so example will be something like this. Uh, this email. So basically, here you can see this is one of my workflow, and these are the runs. So basically, I want to see which are the runs that are successful, and I want to do it this across. So do this across my Kubernetes cluster as well as the archive storage that is Postgres. Now the current uh, architecture it doesn't support it, right? Because there are two different sources, and it's really difficult to combine all of them. Yeah. Uh, any questions on the problem? Okay, uh, folks do shoot questions uh, so that way like we are uh, in line with whatever he's sharing like even if it goes to the basic uh, feel free to ask uh, so that way like we can take more time and then continue uh, so so oh, if not feel free to chat put it in chat uh, it's perfectly fine like we need to take more time because we can't uh, like if, if we are not aligned like then it becomes hard to uh, understand right so Uh, are we moving ahead? So basically, this part is basically we want a see, we want an interface which combines both the active as well as archive runs, and I want to do aggregation and search on top of them because the Kubernetes APIs they are not that good for aggregation, while uh, the ones that are present in uh, Postgres they are not optimized to be searched as well as like aggregate because Argo stores it in a in a, it in a certain uh, tabular form, but it's not well optimized for irrigation and stuff. So the main use case is basically aggregating and searching the runs that are present in both the Kubernetes cluster as well as the archive storage. So next I will give an introduction to admission controllers. So we have, we have got to know about Kubernetes. Now, what are admission controllers are basically, they are plugins so that can be, used on uh, used to enforce certain things on your kubernetes cluster the example will be let's say you don't want any user to uh, submit a workflow which has which doesn't have certain requests and limits specified by that i mean so let's say a, a new uh, teammate joins in the team and then he created a workflow which basically uses a who doesn't define any resource and limit now what might happen is it might take up the entire resource that is present on the cluster. So you don't want that kind of things to happen. And also let's say someone uh, created a workflow and he didn't annotate it properly. Let's say he didn't add proper, uh, what do you say? Proper labels and annotations. And other use case can be like, let's say you don't want any workflows that are running in your cluster to pull images from some unknown registry. So example will be, so right now, like let's say uh, the most used registry is Docker. So basically when you deploy your service on Kubernetes, you basically pull the images from Docker, right? And then what some organizations do is basically create your own uh, repository in GitHub or in Docker. Now you, you might want that all the images that get run on the cluster should be from your own repository and shouldn't be from somewhere else. So those kind of things you can, do through admission controller and another example can be so i gave the example of resource and limit right so if someone doesn't define proper resource and limit then it might cause chaos now another example of admission controller can be like let's say someone didn't define any resource and limit but what we can do is we can enforce those those resource and limits uh limits via the admission controller yeah so these are the different kind of uh different kind of use cases yeah, I have a small question. Like, I mean, I mean, I've personally used operator 
for deploying things like i think i like i relate that to like some sort of web hook as well like here also like the, the flow looks similar so in that case like like is there a difference like what's the difference between like operator versus like admission controller uh, like like how is it like sort of uh, intertwined Okay, uh, so it uh, things with admission controller. It 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 isn't similar to a role based successful system because here you are doing more than just uh, just uh, authorization, right? So you are doing more checks. You are mutating the object. So uh, it won't be similar to role based success control system, but here you can define some authorization attributes. So example will be so whenever you submit a workflow through Argo. It does add a um, what do you say username to it. So basically, the username is fetched via single sign-on. So in that case, what happens is you can create an admission control such that the username is fetched from a uh, fetch from the labels, and it does an authorization from your authorization engine and checks whether that user is allowed to create a resource or not. So yeah, it can be expanded in a lot of ways. You can create an authorization engine using admission controller. You can mutate the request. You can delete the request. Yeah. Uh, does that answer your question, Karl? Yeah. Good. Uh, I think Dinesh. Hey, Dinesh. Hey. Uh, I I dropped off. I don't know whether there was other thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, we lost you. Okay. I I was wondering about like like could you sort of add a bit more context on how admission controller is different than. Operator because I've personally used Kubernetes operator to deploy things like 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 similar to what you're saying is mutating um, the uh, like resources and and how it's defined, uh, but like how how is it different than uh, like admission controller or how does it work together? Yeah, so uh, I I don't have much context on operators as as at this point of time. So yeah, uh, I won't be able to answer that. No worries, no worries. Like we can figure it out and share it later. Then cool, cool, cool. Yeah, but what admission controller does it is uh, is basically uh, from what I know, operators are defined for a specific resource. Let's say you are doing it for a specific deployment, right? Like example, will be deploying key clock or deploying Elasticsearch. That that's where controllers come in. Even Argo is a uh, Argo is actually an operator, Kubernetes operator. But what admission controller does is it 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 is used for intercepting requests that are going to the API server. Yeah, that's uh, yeah yeah that's the difference I know as of now. Cool. Uh, yeah, I will go to the uh, request lifecycle mix. Now uh, this is what the request lifecycle uh, looks like. So let's say you create a Kubernetes resource, right? Let's say example in workflow. Now first it will go to the API HTTP handler. Then the handler will check the authentication and authorization whether the Kubernetes client for which you are sending the request is authorized to create the resource on the cluster and the corresponding namespace or not. And then, okay, one second. Sorry, sorry, I missed something. Uh, okay. So we discussed about the use cases of admission controller, right? And then next, uh, we'll go to the types of admission controllers. So basically, there are two types of admission controllers one is the mutating, and the other one is the validating. So the example that we discussed, let's say uh, key, let's say that there should be uh, no images uh, get, getting pulled from uh, some other repository. So that can be a validation, a validating uh, admission control example. While mutating admission control example will be, let's say I submit a workflow and then my admission controller automatically adds the resources and, and limits to that uh, to that workflow. Yeah. So basically, it mutates my request. While the other one validates my request and re rejects it if it doesn't meet the requirements. So these are the uh, two types of admission controllers. So are you using Kaiverno or OPA? Yeah, I have uh, used OPA once. No, are you but, using uh, in, this, in this example the OPA or Kaiverno? No, no, I am not using that okay. uh, like in this example. But uh, yeah, OPA, OPA is kind of. If I'm not wrong, uh, the uh, the Kubernetes one is a validating admission controller itself. So yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Similarly, Kaverno also do. Yeah, 
means if you okay. want to restrict that uh, docker pull images from docker hub then we can restrict that or some tag we can restrict right 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 so yeah along with that you can basically so those are examples of admission controllers only cool uh yeah i will go to the next uh next slide so here like whenever we create a request it first goes to the http handler and then it checks whether the uh, the client from which it is receiving the request, it, authorize, it is authorized to create the resource. And then all the mutating admission controllers are called in sequence. So if there are two mutating admission controllers configured for this resource, then each one of them are called one by one. And then Kubernetes does the object spring of validation. Now once, once it, uh, it does the schema validation, the native schema validation, then it sends the request to all the validating admission controllers. So since the object won't be mutated here, it can just send requests to all of the validating admission controllers. And if one of them rejects it, the request will be rejected. And once all, the, all of the validating admission controllers pass that, uh, sends the response that the request body is okay, then it is persisted to it is ETCD. Yeah, so this is what the different phases look, uh, looks like. I'll okay. give it a so yeah. uh, uh, sorry I missed a bit. Uh, could you please explain a bit about uh, the mutating admission and the webhooks like uh, how, how they are uh... different, right? No, the, the webhooks actually from um, mutation admission. Uh... So you want to uh, you want to uh, repeat this, part, right? Yeah, please. Okay. So basically I gave examples, right? So basically let's say I have a use case where I want to automatically add resources and limits to, to the workflow so that no uh, workflow can uh, use more than certain amount of resources. So that I can achieve through mutating admission controller. So what mutating admission controller will do is each request that it gets, it will check the, uh, check the request body. And then if the resource and limits are not present, it will add it or it can again override the request and limit. So basically it mutates the request. And the validating admission controller, it's basically used to validate your request. So let's say you want to check whether certain labels are added or not, or the image that you are using in your uh, workflow, whether it's, uh, it's from your own organization repository or not. So let's say you want to enforce that no other images other than the ones present in your organization repository uh, is uh, used in the cluster. Yeah, uh, does that answer your question? Uh, yes. So, uh, so this workflow is nothing but. Uh, I mean, maybe I'm uh, asking like a very open question as I'm mm -hmm. sort of new to this. Um, so, is workflow is like a deployment of a, a pod or? A... Yeah, you can say it's a deployment of a pod or it's same as a pod or a deployment, like it's a Kubernetes resource. So you can, uh, so basically each Kubernetes resource, you can specify admission controllers or validation admission controllers on top of them. So you can create admission controllers on uh, pods or de on deployments. So on all levels you can create because all of them are basically Kubernetes resource. So okay. if I, so let, let me, so if we see this, so these are all the resources that are present in your cluster. Okay. So bindings, config maps. So these are defined kind of resources. And then we have pods, right? And then also we'll have workflows here. Uh, storage, Arco. yeah. So we have, Chrono closed work. So this is also same as like any other resource on the cluster. Yep. Uh, yeah, uh, any questions on uh, this request like second? Let me check. check. Uh, no question. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, sure. I think someone is speaking. Uh, yeah, if you're raising hands, like feel free to uh, go on, uh, shoot questions. I don't see anyone raising hands though. Uh, yeah. So Dinesh, you have asked a question. Uh, so you have mentioned that yeah, it is heavily used in data engineering teams. Yes, correct. So even in the kind of organization that I work in, that is Atlan. So we use workflows to crawl, crawl all the data sources like Snowflake or Postgres or even uh, uh, sources like Power BI and stuff. So we run crawlers uh, based on the time, like whatever requirement, and it crawls all our uh, data sources and then brings metadata from each one of them. So that's why uh, uh, for us, we heavily rely on workflows. Argo itself can be, yeah, yeah, exactly. Argo, it's a, you can directly install it via Helm. If you, if you, if you guys haven't tried your Argo, you should definitely try it. Like it's uh, amazing if you work with uh, any kind of workflow orchestration. It will give you flexibility to basically scale any kind of uh, yeah, workflow. Cool. Uh, yeah, I will then move to the. Okay, so we learned about Kubernetes, we learned about workflows, and then we learned about admission controller. Now, how can we use use all of them to basically solve our problem? The problem was basically we want a unified interface where you can uh, where you can search and uh, aggregate all the runs that are present in Kubernetes cluster as well as that are present in the archive. Uh, storage. So what we have done is we have basically like uh, kind of hacked our way. So what we need is so we get the events from Kubernetes. So let's say I created a workflow and the workflow is getting updated right by the Argo operator. So basically the workflow is in running state, whichever pod fails, it the workflow resources updated. So each of these are generated as event in uh, Kubernetes. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to get the request body for each of the events. So let's say an update happened and we need to also need the uh, request, uh, like basically the object at that point in time. So, okay, I think I need to remove, sorry. Uh, then the next one is basically we need to purchase, purchase the request body in a, in a uh, storage where we can basically easily search and aggregate the uh, uh, aggregator workforce. That's where like we combined, um, we use the admission controllers to solve our problem. So basically this is what the architecture of our service looks like. So we have the cube API server and then we have the admission controller service. Now this admission controller is basically a validating admission controller, but we have modified it to uh, modify it like we haven't used the validating concept here. We just intercepted the request body and persisted it to Elasticsearch. So basically, whenever you create a new workflow, the request is sent to admission controller. It purchases the object in Elasticsearch and sends the OK response to uh, the Kubernetes API server. This is a simple uh, like introduction, but uh, yeah, this is what the uh, how we solve the problem basically. And then any update that happens on the workflow is basically captured by this admission controller again, and then the resources updated on Elasticsearch. Now, since here we got the example key, like uh, the current runs that are running, they are also stored in uh, and uh, through admission controller to Elasticsearch, while we don't capture the delete event. So let's say workflow is deleted, right? So we don't capture it, we just first keep it persistent in Elasticsearch. That way, there is a unified interface for the current runs as well as the archive runs. So, and even here, there is a caveat that like you need to basically archive the ones in your ones present in your Elasticsearch, but that can be huge, like big time. And so, what we do is we basically keep the one year, uh, one year policy where after one year, the old runs will be uh, moved to cold storage. Yeah. So, yeah, this is what the architecture uh, looks like. Uh, any questions still here? Uh, otherwise, we'll move to uh, how we can build a simple admission controller. So in Elasticsearch, like, you wanted to just capture like creation um, like and, and modification. So basically, like all the workflows which is created. So 
like you can just monitor it or just search for something like it's almost right. like a logs kind of a thing but on a higher level for you uh, yes, yes exactly so that like after that like we don't like need to require uh, rely on postgres and stuff right we all the aggregation searching can be done on elastic search stuff so uh, we, we went to such extent that we we don't use uh, the argo apis or the kubernetes apis anymore we just directly rely on uh, elastic search for all our monitoring needs cool uh, then we'll start with uh, like uh, how we can could you actually uh, directly get the kubernetes to stream the events to some data store like in this case if you want elastic search could would that some be a way of aggregating events or something would it be uh, not? I'm not sure whether in that case you will get the request object. I, I'm actually not sure whether I will get the, the entire body. Like, okay, you I want the entire payload and yeah, yes. I need the payload and stuff. And also, this is the example that I gave. We do a uh, lot more things with the admission controller uh, uh, before saving it to Elasticsearch. So, example can be so we basically modify how our goal works. So since we didn't want to change, so I will give an example, right? So let's say I want to automatically create a cron based on one of the labels in my workflow. Now Argo doesn't natively support it, but with admission controller service, I can intercept the request and I can check whether a certain level is added or not. Let's say a cron level is added or not. If that cron level is added, I from the admission controller only, I send a request to Kubernetes API server to create a cron also. So yeah, that, that can be a good example. So yeah, so that's where we thought key, it's a good idea to combine all of this and create an admission controller, which will basically solve our mute like uh, custom business logic that we want to build on top of Argo, as well as the uh, persistence of our uh, runs or basically workflows. Yeah, but that's a nice question key. We should uh, check the events of Kubernetes API server, yes. Cool. Uh, any more questions or we can move to the demo uh, demo or getting a simple one. Also, one other question, like why do you have a client service depending on Elasticsearch? Is there any aggregation or like like I, is it the monitoring service you have? Because you can yeah, yeah. So, very read. Uh, yeah, correct. So client service by this I'm referring to our front end or basically any other uh, service that wants to uh, connect to Elasticsearch. So this is any other service like front end or anything. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah. And this can get in a number of these kinds of services interacting with the Elasticsearch cluster. Yeah, okay. So let's build a simple admission. So uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll check whether the workflow that we're going to create starts with, uh, the, its name starts with uh, go first. And then we'll also, what we'll do is we'll mutate the workflow and add a label go first bang. So we create a workflow, but we uh, don't add this level, then admission controller will automatically add this level. So this is what we are going to do. Uh, the repository is available here, but yeah, I will go walk through the code and how we basically deploy it. So this is what the project structure looks like. So we have a main.go, we have our Docker file, we have some manifest, we have some example resources, and we have certificates. And then for development, I will be using Scaffold. So Scaffold is basically a tool to develop your Kubernetes applications locally. And then this is the best script to basically uh, start our service in that uh, Docker container. So let's start with uh, the Scaffold file. So what this does is basically it creates an image named job sync with the current context. And once the image is created, it deploys this uh, deployment file. That is deployment script and our web hooks. I will go through each one of them one by one. So let's start with our uh, main node. Just another, another thing that I forgot to mention is basically your admission controller runs and need to run in uh, need to run in TLS mode. So each communication that happens between the Kubernetes API server uh, to your admission controller needs to be secure. 
So it cannot be uh, running in HTTP. It should be in HTTPS. Cool. So uh, in the main.go, we create a router or basically a server which has two parts. One is a mutate endpoint, the other one is a validate endpoint. And we have corresponding handlers, uh, defined handlers for that. Now let's start with the uh, mutating handler. So first we log the request. And then what I do is we uh, decode the request. For decode, I have created another function. What it does is basically reads the request body. And then there is a universal deserializer that uh, Kubernetes provides where basically you can decode your request to an admission review uh, structure. And then you can create a response, which basically adds the UID. And then you can say it's whether it's allowed or not. But for now, since we have, haven't decided whether this request should be allowed or not, we are not doing this. And we are printing this request. So we got the admission review request from this function. The next thing is, so we got the admission review request uh, for this uh, request. And then we check the operation that is uh, happening. So in this create, uh, case, we are just checking the create operations. So if the operation is create, then what you are doing is we are creating a patch type. So this is the patch type. It's a JSON patch and we are creating a patch. So in this case, we are adding or uh, doing an operation add. So and the path is metadata, uh, metadata level. And what we are doing is basically we are adding a label go first bank. So what this will do is it will mutate the request object and it will add this uh, label to label and on this path. So basically you add labels in metadata.label, right? So that's where uh, this will be there. And then what we do is we may create the admission review response. So we make sure that the response is allowed. We add the patch type. So our patch type is uh, JSON patch. So we add this and then we add the patch. So we create a byte array of the string and then we add it to the patch. Now we send the response back. Now what uh, Kubernetes will, uh, so API server will see that uh, the request is allowed and, uh, and it got a patch and it will apply the patch to the resource. So this is what the mutating handler looks like. And then the then comes the validating handler. <clears throat> so same here, we decode the request for and create an admission review request. We check if the kind is worked through or not. And then what we do is, yeah. So here, what I'm doing is I'm checking whether the name has a prefix gophers or not. So if if it doesn't have a prefix gophers, what I'm doing is I'm making the allowed equal to false. And then I'm setting the result as status, bro, you are in go for status. So basically I want uh, that every resource that is create, getting created today should have, its name should start with go first. And then I'm sending the request back. Now, after this, what we can do is we can process the, uh, process the resource in here. So this is what the code will look like. But for now, I'm just uh, uh, using the validation. And then I'm sending a response. Back. So this is the this is what the code looks like. Any questions until here? Good. Uh, no. Yes, yes. Yeah. I can use self sign certificate. For that, we will go to the manifest file now. So in the manifest, I have four files. The first one is deployment of the admission control itself. So here I'm creating a service. I have given the name as job thing and the selector as uh, job thing. So this will, what this will do is it will select, uh, select the, uh, sorry, select the ports which are, have a label job thing. Yeah, now next come, uh, we come to the de uh, deployment. We add the label job thing. And then in the spec, we also add the match labels again because we want to match pods with this uh, label. And then next, uh, we create the, so we define the template for the pod. So here we basically give the name as server, the image as job sync, since we named our image as job sync in the scaffold YAML. And when we expose the pod, that is 8443, 
And since this server needs to run in TLS mode, we mount the uh, secret, that is the uh, uh, key and PM file. So we uh, mount it to this uh, container. A folder where basically I have documented how to create the certificate and key because this, is, this will be out of scope. And then uh, we'll go how we'll be defining our mutating webhook. So basically, here we are defining the mutating webhook. We are giving a name and then we are giving the name of the a webhook. Here, what we are basically doing is we are creating we are uh, creating the config such that so here. We are defining the name of the service that we want to communicate. It's in default, and we want to hit the muted endpoint. And then, since the service is running with the certificate and the key, we are adding the CA bundle here. So this is the same uh, thing that is used for uh, signing the uh, for the TLS. And then we define the rules. So basically, what this animation controller uh, mutating web configuration will do is that any request for create an update for workflows. It will send a send a request to slash muted endpoint of the job sync service. So this is what the mutating uh, webhook will do, and the same for validating webhook. So here just the kind is different, but any request, any create or update request that comes for workflows, it will send a request to slash validate endpoint using the CA bundle. Yeah, uh, yeah, these are the basically. Deployment files. Yeah, we have gone through two endpoints that is mutated and validated, and we have defined them in our uh, validating webhook. So, for validating webhook, it will call the validate, and the mutating uh, webhook, it will call the muted endpoint. Now, let's see this in action. No workflows present in the cluster. So, now let me uh, start, run my service. So what I will do is I will go skip for dev. Now this will build a Docker container and deploy it uh, on Minikube. So we have all our service jobs created, and our st server is started to run. So now let's deploy and workflow. So for that I will go to example resources, and then here I have created a workflow. We can ignore this part because this is specific to Argo, but here I've given the name of test. Now let's let's run, uh, let's deploy this okay, apply. So here you can see my request is rejected. So error from server. Yeah, my request is denied. So since uh, my name, uh, the name of my workflow didn't start with offers, my request is rejected. And here we can see on the server, first the mutating request is sent, and then the validating request is sent. And during validation, it fails. So yeah, the request is rejected. Now let's change this name to, and then let's apply it. Now see our, uh, you know, this thing passed. And then we also, the request is uh, will, uh, present here. So first the request, mutating request, sent, and then the validating request. And we also uh, saw that in the mutating request, what we have done here is basically added a new label named uh, Gophers Bangalore. In the workflow, you can see by default, I have any, any labels. Let's see whether that label is added or not. So if you can see here, so we have our label added. So basically the mutating admission controller added the label that is Gophers Bangalore. So this is uh, these are these are the examples of basically mutating versus uh, validating and machine controllers. Yeah, any questions still? Going so any doubts?
Okay, sorry. Uh, like, how does the like flow look like? Like the validation and mutation. Uh, is it in order? Like, what order does it run? Like the flow you had. So basically, whenever you submit the request, right? Mm -hmm. First, it first it resets the Cube API server, and then it does the authentication and authorization of the request. And then all the mutating webhooks are called in a sequential manner. And once the uh, your request is mutated, then Kubernetes does its uh, own schema validation, and after that, it sends the request to all your validating admission controllers. And once your validating admission controller returns that the request is uh, object is okay, it is then persisted persisted to it. So, so in our case, like we added uh, those label, right? Like it gets added and then it gets validated. Uh, with the yes, correct. Okay. Correct. So first the mutating request is sent and then the validating request is sent. Yep. Yeah, any more questions? Cool. Uh, yeah, that was the age for today. Uh, yeah, you can find the code on my GitHub. So the repository name is code meetup Bangalore 606. Yeah, uh, that's it. Thank you, everyone. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that like folks have more questions. Like now you can actually shoot even basic questions and then we can sort of have a discussion. Um, like, like you would have a hard like list of questions during the talk uh like even if it's not like if it's diverging from the core talk like feel to shoot now uh, we can have an open discussion itself uh, so feel free to shoot questions now hey i i had a question so uh i wanted to understand your larger uh, use case especially you know pushing the data to elastic uh, so i think is it uh, is it more of uh, uh, convenience of having this workflow data in uh, in a single place like Alex, uh, like elastic search or did you have I mean, did you is it a more of a performance issue like with querying to a kubernetes cd and so on why did you choose to yeah. so correct so basically as i mentioned so basically once your resources are present in uh, kubernetes cluster it needs it needs to be removed after a certain amount of time, right? Otherwise, your cluster will get cluttered and then you won't be able to create new workflows. So let's say uh, there is a limitation on number of workflows that are that can be present on the cluster. So you have to move them out. So what uh, Argo does is it basically moves that moves them out to uh, Postgres. But since both of them are like different sources and we can't combine the data and aggregate on top of them, so we wanted to solve that problem. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah. Slightly out of uh, topic question, especially with respect to Argo, uh, I'm uh, aware of Argo in the context of CD. Uh, mm -hmm. So between Argo CD and Argo workflows, uh, you know, what is the relation? Is one using the other or something like that? Yeah, Argo CD is mostly used for deploying your services. While Argo workflows is a container orchestration engine. So basically you can run your workflows on schedule basis while argo uh, argo cd you can basically make sure key whenever you push a repository to your code those services are deployed properly on the Kubernetes cluster right yeah okay but, yeah thanks yeah. Good. and also uh since uh yeah, Karan mentioned the question, right? Basically, role-based access control system. This is something very interesting. We do it. So, how, uh, as I mentioned, ki we basically use labels to do some kind of authorization on the admission controller uh, too. So, since uh, Argo provides single sign-on, so what it does is uh, it basically adds label who created the workflow, and then since that label cannot be changed by anyone until and unless someone has access to the Kubernetes cluster directly, so we can. Uh, do some authorization on the admission controller itself. Yeah, so that is uh, also something interesting. Um, like, 
I get dropped off like a while, like even sort of linked to the earlier question. Um, like I, I can understand you want to monitor and then see things, but what is the use case from business perspective? Like, like as in, uh, do you just want to see, hey, how many um, of this particular workflow is run? Uh, or is it like, like you want to see a particular workflow of failures? Because what I'm sort of also linking to is like, can each workflows, like, like which is defined like the code, can emit metrics to let's say some Inflex or Prometheus? And that in turn can be used for monitoring. So from the logs which you push, like what is what is it something you are depending on? Yeah. So basically, our the so uh, workflow is one of our main like core components of the platform that we are building. So here the main thing we need is basically the entire request object. So uh, what we need is let me share my screen actually. I think I might have a screenshot. Let, let me give me a second. That will give a better idea. Uh, I can stop recording uh, if you want. If you are sharing something, uh -huh. do you want me yeah. to? Yeah, I think we can stop. Okay, stop screen. I'll I'll stop the recording.